All right, so we're ready to start talking about projectile motion. And that's motion that's mainly happening in two dimensions or more. And uh, a projectile is an object that is launched in the air and moves mainly under the force of gravity. So two things we're going to do in these problems. We're going to neglect variation of gravitational acceleration, and we're going to neglect air resistance. So the first one, neglect variation of gravitational acceleration. What the heck is that supposed to mean? Uh, put simple, all we're saying is, you know, the, the, uh, the acceleration due to gravity on the planet Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared. An important thing to know about this is this is on the surface. And it's a, obviously an average value. I mean, there are certain pot, spark, uh, parts on the Earth where it may be a slightly more or slightly less depending on where you're located. But this is uh, about what it is. Now if I was to fire an object up a thousand kilometers, it's quite a bit, the the um, gravitational acceleration is going to vary quite a bit as well. So up here it's not necessarily going to be 9.81. Well, it's it's definitely not going to be 9.81 meters per second squared. It's going to be a lot lower. So for problems involving such such a high distance you're going up, you need a more elegant way of talking about you have to be able to include gravity. And for those problems, we'll end up using Newton's universal law of gravitation. But for these problems, we're assuming the objects are are projected into the air uh, relatively close to the surface, so we can just use g. All right, so we need to build. We need to take something that's simple and then build upon it. So for now, g is constant. Uh, second thing, so we're going to neglect air resistance. It just doesn't even exist in our physical world. Imagine it like the Matrix. You're just designing your own world, and you're trying to eventually make it comparable to the world we live on. But for now, it's, it's just too much to consider all these extra things when really what we should be focusing on is is the motion itself. We can get to the uh, we can get to all the other stuff later after we build strong foundations. So there's two things we're going to be assuming. One, G doesn't change when you go into the air. I promise not to give you any problems where you're actually going 1,100 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers into the air, as your answer is just not going to really mean anything. Uh, the second thing is there's going to be no air resistance, and that's pretty much going to be ever. Uh, it just overcomplicates the matter. So we're going to keep it really simple, and all your books also do the same thing. You'll also see, assume no air resistance. Well, yeah, you're going to assume that because you don't know how to deal with it. So until you know how to deal with it, we're assuming no air resistance, and we're assuming gravity is constant for all these problems. All right, so let's consider, before really getting busy with projectile motions, consider you have this object, and it's it's above the ground right now. Now, what forces are acting upon this object? You could imagine someone just let it go, and so now here's just this object. What's going to happen to it? And this is the planet Earth. So what's going to happen to this object? Well, the force of gravity is going to pull it down. Specifically, it's going to pull it down at 9.81 meters per second squared, which we can simplify in the problems we'll do is 9, 10 meters per second squared. All right, so let me ask you a question. Are there any forces pulling it this way on the horizontal or this way on the horizontal? The answer is no. No, the only thing acting upon this in our world of no air resistance or anything like that, the only thing, the only force acting upon this object is the force of gravity. All right, what does this mean? Let's say you fired something off on this Earth, and you fired off with this initial velocity here. Now, as it continues its motion, and it eventually lands down here. The x component, the entire time, is chained, is is constant. It's every second that goes by, it covers the same horizontal distance. Now remember, we're neglecting air resistance because otherwise there would be all these particles here 
that would interfere and slow the ball down. But it's pretty negligible, even in our world, for most of the scenarios. So we're just going to remove air resistance. We're dealing with our matrixy type physics world, uh, where there is no air resistance. So this, this horizontal component is not compelled to slow down. It's compelled to continue its motion. As Galileo once said, an object in motion in a straight path or whatever will continue in that path at a constant velocity until forever, you know? And until something acts upon it. So this horizontal component each time is going to be the same exact value for every second that passes. It's a constant movement. The y, the y vector here, this vector, this vector does have a force acting upon it, specifically the force of gravity. It's pulling it down. And that's why, if you've noticed this ball, its trajectory, its path, that's why it goes up until it runs out in a sense of its velocity, until its velocity is all used up, and then it starts adding back down. So you have this initial going up, and then gravity slows it down, stops it, and brings it back to the Earth. So when we're handing projecti handling projectile motion problems, and we're given some vector v at some angle from, this, from the ground, we could break it into its x and y components and evaluate the situation through these components. Now notice, as far as everything goes with how long the ball is in the air and how high it goes and all these things, these are all dependent on the y component. Once you know how long the ball is in the air and you want to find out how far in the x direction that ball travels, well, that's what the x component's for. That'll tell you how far it went. The y component will tell you how long it took to drop and how high it went. All right, so we need to talk about these things before we actually handle problems. Otherwise, you'll just be confused with uh, with what you're really doing here. So basically, you're given some some initial velocity vector here, and you're given the angle that it is from the x-axis. And very easily, you can say, well, this will be the x component. It'll be uh, the magnitude of vector v cosine theta and you could also say when well, this is the uh, the y component it'll be magnitude vector v sine theta that's good now it's important to understand that how these two behave we just said the y component is the one that's being affected by gravity not the x component all right so if you want to know anything about the particle you need you the y component is going to be telling you most of your stuff and then the x component can tell you how far it went so just want to kind of throw it out let's imagine here that this uh, this vector when you multiply it and you got your uh, y component vector let's just say whatever it was it ended up being 10 meters per second all right and over here we have another scenario a different scenario separate scenario where we have a one-dimensional problem where the object is going up at 10 meters per second. Well, I will tell you that the amount of time it takes for this ball, even with its x component, the amount of time it'll take this ball to hit the ground is the same amount of time that it'll take this object to go up and return to the ground. So, what am I saying here, basically? So when you're handling motion in two dimensions, you actually can split it into two problems, two one-dimensional problems, and it becomes just as easy as one-dimensional motion. So this, this vector here would tell you you could figure out how long in the air. Well, just to highlight that, let's go ahead and do that. Well, as the ball goes up into the air and it comes back down, it'll go up at 10 meters per second, and when it returns, it'll be negative 10 meters per second. So the final velocity is negative 10 meters per second, and the initial velocity is 10 meters per second. So we have final velocity equals initial velocity plus at, where if we consider this positive and this negative, gravity 
is going to be pulling down at 9.81 meters per second squared, which we'll just say 10 meters per second squared. So what we have, when we plug in our values, we have negative 10 meters per second. And I know I said to always solve these with variables, so we're going to actually do it that way and then plug them in. So we'd like to know the time. Subtract VI from each side. You get VF minus VI is equal to AT. Divide each side by A. You get T is equal to the change in velocity over the acceleration. The acceleration here is actually negative G. So we'll go ahead and plug in our values actually. So we have our final velocity is negative 10 meters per second minus our initial which is 10 meters per second over acceleration due to gravity but it's pulling down and we call this negative so well it's pulling down at negative 10 meters per second squared. So we end up with negative 20 meters per second over negative 10 meters per second squared. Negatives cancel. 20 divided by 10 is 2. And when you multiply these units here, you have second squares over meters. The seconds in meters will cancel, and you're left with 2 seconds. Sorry about that. It looks a little messy, but it's 2 seconds. We know that. We know the ball will go up and it'll come back down and it'll take two seconds to happen. The important thing to remember is when you're looking at projectile motion and you isolate your Y component, however long, if you take that and imagine it like this, like a one-dimensional problem, you rip this out, you rip it out of the problem, I don't know, pull out a whole new sheet of paper and you just act like this is a one-dimensional problem, however long this object is in the air in your one-dimensional problem, is the same amount of time the object is in the air in your uh, in your projectile motion problem. All right, so a recap on this projectile motion motion uh, video. Remember, this is just a basic video, kind of helping you to kind of see exactly what's going on. There's two conditions. G is constant. We're not thinking about how G can vary depending on how far from the surface we get. We're assuming all the problems are going to happen relatively near the surface, so we will always use a relatively uh, const uh, constant value for G. Two, no air resistance or any resistance of any kind until we say there's some sort of uh, friction or resistance. But in our physics world that we've been creating so far, there is no air resistance at the moment. All right, so G is constant, and there's no air resistance. And then that would imply, well, whenever you have a, v a vector that's being shot out, your Y component can be treated as a one-dimensional problem. So I would just I would determine my uh, two vectors here, my X component vector, and I would determine my Y component vector, and once I knew my Y component vector, I could just pull it aside and handle it like it's a one-dimensional problem. So that's going to kind of be the theme of what we'll be doing. And we'll, we'll incorporate uh, strategies and shortcuts and methods of doing it quicker and such. But for now, this is basically the idea. You're just, you, have your velo you have your vector uh, some degrees above some axis, break it into its components, deal with the deal with them as one dimensional problems thank you for watching i hope this helped uh prepare you for projectile motion and then coming soon will be a video that will actually start to uh, get into solving some problems on projectile motion